Night at nine, brand new and exclusive to Sky Atlantic HD. Let's have a look at the Saturday newspapers. Let's do so in the company of Paul Lewis of The Guardian, alongside him, the Winter Olympic snowboarder, that's the Winter Olympic snowboarder, and Daily Mail columnist Zoe Gillings, just in case anybody was confused about where we are seasonally. <laughs> it's the summer. Uh, who's going to start? Zoe, I think you're going to kick off with the s mirror. This is Jessica Ennis, unsurprisingly. Yes, yeah, it's a, um, an article about how well she did yesterday. Yeah, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, considering the amount of pressure that must be on her um, at the moment, obviously, face of the Olympics, the amount of media articles, adverts on the TV, she's absolutely everywhere. Um, so for her to come out yesterday and do absolutely fantastic in, in the first few events of the heptathlon, uh, she did so well in the hurdles that, in fact, that time would have won her the uh, Olympics in Beijing in the hurdle event. Um, so she did, she did absolutely brilliantly. And it's her first ever Olympics as well. Um, I only found this out recently. I thought that she'd been to one or two before, yeah. but I found out this is actually the first time she managed to go because she was injured for Beijing. So first time in the Olympics, in the athletes' village, the extra media attention and everything all on top of each other. And she's doing completely brilliantly. So hopefully um, her good form continues today as well. There's this kind of equivalence to the Olympics in terms of the disciplines. I mean, you get a gold for doing, I don't know, think of a sport that doesn't require that much effort. They all require effort, <laughs> you know what I mean. But in the heptathlon, it's multidisciplinary and you have to be a master of so many different disciplines. I mean, it really is extraordinary. It's, it, I think yeah. it's one of the most remarkable events of the, of the Olympics. I'm actually extremely excited because I've got tickets for tonight in the Olympic Stadium and we'll be seeing Jessica Ennis. Hopefully the final event will be the 800 metres and we'll see whether she wins gold. But the pressure on that woman is just remarkable. Yeah. And I have to say, it's a great privilege to sit beside Zoe. I, I take my hat off to anyone who can go through that kind of pressure. I mean, many of us in our normal lives, we kind of buckle when we face that kind of pressure. But the enormity of expectation in front of a home crowd and to be called the face of the Olympics and to be told that you are the single biggest hope for the, the entire host nation is just incredible. Yeah, yeah I, I'd watch that corridor just as you're leaving the building, by the way, Paul. There's, the light's gone and you'll find that one of those producers might just have that ticket if you're, while you're not looking. Um, <laughs> to, you have to try to, hard. <laughs> <laughs> to the sun and your choice uh, on a distant page 59. Well, exactly. I was going through the papers. It wasn't until page 59 of the sun that I found a story that really took my fancy. And it's essentially because, I mean, you hear so much about sports people who earn huge amounts of money and footballers on tens of millions of pounds you know but it's quite a nice so antidote of, to all it's that it's such it? an antidote and so many of these olympians actually i think live quite humble lives and we have here you know one of our judo athletes who had to create a website to ask for money to buy herself a new car and that failed but a, a nice couple came forward to lend her a, a replacement for her clapped out old golf and it just makes you realize actually that many many of these people not just in some of the developing nations which are here in london but actually even in our own country have you know despite some funding from the lottery and some sponsorship find it actually quite difficult during those four years mm. in the run-up to the Olympics to, to pay their way. It's hard not to think back to the words of Bradley Wiggins early this week, isn't it? And to, uh, when he launched into a bit of a diatribe, really, about the nature of fame and celebrity and that, you know, mm. the people are... Britain is full of people who are famous for being famous, whereas mm. he puts in, as I'm sure, Zoe, mm. you've done too, the hard yakka, the hard miles <laughs> that get unrecognised. Yeah, he was very much to, uh, going along the lines of he, he doesn't want to be famous, that's not why... He got into cycling or anything, he got into it for the love of the sport yeah. and, and because he loves competing and loves cycling and not to become famous. Yeah. Well, I think that's precisely one of the reasons people are enjoying the Olympics so much actually, is many of the competitors, people like Zoe, who actually you know, don't come across as celebrities, don't come across as these kind of polished characters. Um, and you know, Rebecca Adlington, for example, has just got such a wonderful, humble, decent personality. And she's really the norm uh, if mm. you look at British Olympians. And I think it's the fact that they seem and are people like us that, that really makes it feel like it's a, a, a game yeah. that we feel some more ownership over. So help us with one thing as a, as a competitor. How do you feel, I mean, Paul was mentioning the swimming, how do you feel about that moment that the swimmers have been interviewed in particular? You know, their, their bodies are a playground to all kinds of chemicals, natural chemicals <laughs> that are rushing around their body. Yeah. And, you know, their heads are all over the place. It's hugely emotional. I know. And I'm... the camera pounces. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've done very well, actually, all of them, to Straight be able to together. talk and make any sense yeah. whatsoever after just going, and they're going full out, they're, they're putting everything they possibly can into that race, uh, and they must be so tired after it. And also, to recover as well, I've been very impressed with the swimmers doing kind of 
one race and then an hour, I think there was one, I think it was an American girl who did mm. one race, did, did very well, and 15 minutes later she was back in the pool again doing, yeah. doing another, another race. Well, look at Phelps, you know. Oh, uh, yes. Should we go to the Indy, Zoe? This is uh, your story about not all about winning, not for these unlikely heroes. Yes, this um, article is mainly about a Saudi Arabia woman who uh, is the first woman ever to compete for her country in the Olympics. Um, and I think it's, it's a brilliant thing that's happening gradually. It's been happening over the past hundred years or so, of women getting involved more and more. And now um, I, th I believe there's a statistic of actually every single country has got a woman competing now, which is it's brilliant just for women overall. I mean, sport is such a great thing for everyone to be involved in. And um, I would hate to think that anyone would be messing up missing out at all and yeah. unfortunately she didn't do too well in her event she got knocked out of the, the judo she was competing in after about 82 seconds i think it was but yeah. she had a massive smile on her face afterwards and she was just so pleased to actually be there and, and competing and the, her dad was there watching her which i think made it extra special as well we're finding it hard to leave the olympics behind as you can tell <laughs> but let's try paul uh, this is your story about uh, not plastic just tough Yes, indeed. Well, I mean, you know, you could pick so many of these incredible human stories from the Olympics. And I just thought this one um, in, the, in the Telegraph really struck a chord with me. I'm not sure why. I mean, it's just... Um, it's still the Olympics. I thought we'd moved on to the, the Martian story. Oh, you've got the Martian yeah. story. Well, in, uh, if we could talk about Martian <laughs> stories. The Martian story is incredible. The Martian story... <laughs> You know, when you've got a, a game as big as the Olympics, sorry, something as big as the Olympics, I know you to, don't want to talk about it, but you, you forget there are these other stories around. And just remarkable that we're about to land this um, robot that, we've, that, that has been called the Curiosity, which is going wonderful to... Name. Pardon? Wonderful name. It's, it's a wonderful <laughs> name. Unfortunately, I don't have the copy with me here. But it's basically it's gone to Mars to find out whether there is life there. But if you see a picture of this thing, I mean, it really looks like an alien itself. It's going to land on Monday. It has these seven minutes of terror... As, uh, as, as NASA are calling it, where it has to go through essentially the kind of atmospheric um, protection around Mars, which, will, which is a really difficult thing to do. And if it survives that and parachutes down to Earth, it will start basically blowing apart bits of rocks and doing lots of kind of chemical analysis to see whether the conditions there could have uh, hosted life in the past. And if it's the case, it will be a really remarkable finding. Uh, scien uh, scientists are beloved of those uh, metaphors, or similes, I should say. So they keep lightening the lander to a mini. It's the size of a mini. But how big is a mini these days? They keep getting bigger and bigger. I'm struggling with that one. It's the size of a double-decker bus, isn't it? Mini's it? quite small, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zoe, talk to us about flexible working. Uh, yeah, there's an article here about, um, about flexible working and how it can work. Um, predominantly, it's focused on a guy called Richard Pringle, who works in the job centre. Um, mainly, but then he's also trying to start up his own uh, strength and conditioning business kind of on the side, so to speak. So he's got flexible working through the job setting, which is allowing him to build this other business, which hopefully will work, but he doesn't know for sure whether it will do. So he, he's got the flexibility within his main job to give him the stability of money coming in on a day to day basis while still trying to build up this other business within kind of the sector that he's passionate about um, and this one struck me personally because um, that's in effect what I'm doing in my sport I won't run my own online business and um, to give me sort of a steady stream of income and then um, government funding and sponsors kind of come and go as, as they do they're not that reliable um, year to year so it's kind of I can really relate to having something steady while you're trying to make something else work which is a bit more Unreliable. Paul, just time because we're about to have a debate on the to uh, on the riots of last year. Very shortly, I, you were prob I probably wasn't the only journalist. Perhaps you thought this too last year. That come the Olympics, the riots may cast a shadow. We may even see a repeat. The thought of that happening now is unconscionable, really, isn't it? Maybe wrong, of course. Well, but never say unconscionable. I mean, I think quite unlikely. The national mood wouldn't be that one reason, that would be yeah. particularly befitting to disorder on that scale. But you know, th there are a number of stories in the papers this morning about the anniversary of the death of Mark Duggan, which is today. And it was two days after Mark Duggan's death a year ago that the riots began in London before they spread across the country. And I think police will be, and I think we know that they are monitoring the situation, they're going to have resources available in case something happens. Um, but it's just, it just two sides of um, such a... To, to such different sides to a country when you think about it. I mean, the, the, the feeling that we all, we all have at the moment about the Olympics, the national mood, it was only a year ago that we saw some 15,000 people come out into the streets and do some really quite terrible things, stuff that we would never imagine we would see in a country like ours. Um, and it, you know, it, it is a strange reminder. I think if it hadn't been for the Olympics, we would have seen a lot more one-year-on anniversary stories about the riots. And I think 
I think probably many editors feel that this isn't the time to do that. And we at The Guardian ran a lot of work about two or three weeks ago. Um, and I do think it was just a very phenomenal moment for the country. And we need to reflect on why it happened if we're going to stop it from happening well, again. we're going to do that very shortly. Paul Lewis, Zoe Gillings, thank both very much for your picks today. Really enjoyed those. Thanks a lot. This is Sky News coming up a year after those summit riots we were just talking about across much of England have what 